All right. Okay, speaker view. Okay. Uh, Claire, shall we get started? We shall. All right. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, today's Thursday, so it's uh, Jordan Peterson's Jordan Peterson Thursday. And we are going through his series on personality and its transformations. Um, Claire is going to be leading the discussion today. And the uh, topic is going to be mythology and history, you know, uh, connecting that with personality. So with that, let me hand it over to Claire. Let me do one more thing before I do that. Uh, we are going to do a far more interactive format today. We are going to experiment with that. So Claire has divided her presentation into three parts, three shorter parts. So what she do, what she will do is that she will put something on the table, and we found that at least like good 40, 50 percent of you have watched the video. So after the first, you know, first part, we'll open it up so people can not only ask questions but they can make comments. Um, so that's that's the plan. All right. So with that, Claire, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you all for being here on another beautiful Jordan Peterson Thursday. It's just me today. Um, we're missing Roger. So um, in true Jordan Peterson fashion, I'm going to face this dragon and do it badly and stumble through it. Um, so please forgive me and jump in if I mess something up as I inevitably will. Um, but this is really core basic Jordan Peterson. We are going to, you know, talk, touch on a lot of themes that I think we've already talked about in 12 Rules for Life, everything from lobsters to Pinocchio to Jonah and the whale, um, and this kind of historical and his and mythological context for psychology and personality is a really fundamental and kind of a unique identifier of Peterson's um, and sort of Petersonian thought. So um, in this series, Peterson is going to really take us through several of his favorite of the clinical theorists, um, and he's going to use film to do it. He's going to, um, you know, go in depth on to different degrees on these theorists. But before he gets there, what he's really showing in this in this lecture is that all the clinical theories surrounding personality are really embedded, embedded in these classical narratives and mythological structures, which go back to the beginning of human evolution. Um, and to start to do this, he's gonna unpack some of those myths. The ones that we'll talk about today together are Jonah and the whale. That's the real focus and, and the real highlight of this um, lecture. We'll touch on Harry Potter, Pinocchio, and also all of just those early fundamental archetypes that came out of our evolutionary biology and just sort of our origin all the way back from when we were single-celled organisms, um, or at least lobsters, we'll say. So um, to start off, Peterson is going to, he really uses Jonah and, and, and the whale as kind of the fundamental cover photo for this um, for this lecture. Um, and a lot of these old stories like Jonah and the Whale, like the Grimm's brother fairy tales, these are very old. You know, there's, there's Grimm's brothers that they've dated back to sort of 15, 15,000 years ago. Um, and, and what we can take from these for ancient stories and stories that are told over generations is that in order to get passed on, those stories need to be reduced and explained to someone else and then reduced and explained to someone else so many times that everything that exists when you get to this far away has to be meaningful um, because of that game of telephone that we all know that you know things things get misinterpreted and changed and stories change to reflect culture but everything that is passed on and is held constant those are there for a reason and peterson really wants us to look at those and think about those heavily um, furthermore when you think about these stories that have exist over time they're also the amalgamation of all the other stories going on within that time. And so in this way, we start to arrive at what Peterson refers to as his meta narrative, because basically what you're doing is you're taking out all the features of 
all the best adventure books. You're taking out all the features of the heroes and the kings. You're taking out all the features of the, the evil, the bad, the chaos, and, and, and condensing it, right? To get that gist every time. And so you do get the sort of meta narrative that exists across stories, across history. Um, the other really weird thing about stories, and I think we'll start to see this immediately by Jonah, which is a very ancient story, but it involves a human getting swallowed by a whale. That's like bizarre. And yet we sort of take it for, to understand. We understand immediately sort of the metaphorical nature for it. Um, Pinocchio also is inside, inside a whale. And he just starts to unpack. It's very weird that we can sit in a movie theater and watch these, these movies that are abstract and odd and not have anything to do with reality. And it's not only comprehensible, but it's enjoyable. And that there's something there that is a deeper meaning that we understand that sparks that for us. And so it doesn't appear weird, even though it really is. And so what is that? Those are these, these really archaic rituals. And, and Peterson says that really movies are like the most expensive artifacts that we produce right now in our society because they are the core, those core stories, those core myths. Um, but you know, we're spending a lot of money on them and we're loving to watch them. Um, and, and these stories, Peterson says, they interact really or, or they live right at the border of known and unknown. And so there is something about them that feels outside of our knowledge and we don't truly understand it, but we take, we take it, but we do. Right? We don't need to be explained every word because there is something so deep that relates to our nature um, that, that we understand. Um, the key, the example that he uses later in this video is baboons. So baboons are constantly communicating with each other through, you know, they understand hierarchies, they understand um, relationships, but they don't need to articulate it. They don't need to tell that story. And so that uh, that is an example of that underlying meaning that we all understand in these stories without actually having to know why is it true that hierarchies are meaningful or any of that. We just feel it to be that. Um, another example of this is dance and music. Why, why do we know that that is powerful to us? It's just something intrinsically that. Um, he calls to that kind of the idea of like, you know, tribal groups dancing in imitation of their prey. So acting out a wolf dance or, or of your predator is that you're really under, you're, you're trying to understand, watch and interpret that which we take all around us. And so myths and stories in that way, they start to um, help us interpret that border of chaos because we don't really get it. We don't know what it's like to be a wolf, but let's play there. Let's tell stories. Let's imitate it through dance and music um, to start to get a feeling. So that, you know, right on that border of order and chaos is where these stories um, live. So, um, Peterson asks often in this lecture, kind of what are what is this fundamental question of life that these psychologists and clinical theorists are trying to understand? And historically, science has has tried to answer the question of what is what is the world made of, right? What is stuff made of? What is the world? Um, and what Peterson is far more interested in, and this is really gets to the clinical side, is how do we act in the world? How does one conduct yourself in the world? And this is the fundamental utility that myth solved, that myth has in the same way that science helps to prove what the world is made of. Um, and so, you know, as we interact through life, we what we pay attention to is 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 what is what smiles at us right we are always reflecting some ideal and interacting with the world and learning from it um, and acting out that kind of meta ideal um, so these stories as we said they're they're acting on the perimeter of what we know and it's on that foundation that our entire understanding of, so, okay, here's everything we know, it's in a circle. These stories help us, un, you know, kind of unpack the border. And on that foundation, 
we rest our entire understanding of also everything in chaos of of everything and so it's on these stories that the foundation of society and culture really rests um the huge example of this is in western culture is this idea of transcendent worth that individuals have a transcendent worth that is a western ideal that really underpins all of Western society, um, you know, in, in our legal system, uh, you we have certain human rights as individuals, and we are, have intrinsic worth as individuals. Um, and this is not really provable. There is no science that can back this up. That's why, you know, that's why, you know, that the phrase we hold these truths to be self evident because there is no proof. Th these are really what Peterson calls axioms of faith because what our founding fathers figured out was if we treat others like they have intrinsic value and they feel the same way about us and treat us that way, then society will be better. And therefore these truths are self-evident because of the implication that they have. Um, and that is a, Peterson says, is a very, very old idea. Um, you know, going back to, if you think of sort of tribal identity of, okay, I understand my tribe. I, there's something that unites us all together, which is our identity. But then as tribes started to interact with each other, as nations grew, as nations combined, you suddenly start to need a meta identity to combine those different groups. Um, and so that's where something like individual transcendent youth helps to be that meta narrative that sort of combines all our many different value systems. Um, and, and we need to, to constantly have sort of this meta value system to, to um, unite us. Otherwise we're gonna have to sort through those differences. Um, we're all, we're social creatures, we're creatures of our environment, and we're always playing games and interacting with them. Um, so to bring this, let's go through the story of Jonah, and then we're going to pause and we'll just talk about all of this. So um, who, I mean, I, I think everyone is more or less familiar, but I, you know, it's just a weird one. You know, the guy gets swallowed by the whale, but you're like, why? Um, so here's the basis of the story, which is that Jonah gets a call from God and God says, hello, Jonah, there, there's this city, it's called Nineveh, and it's, it's really falling into immorality. It's falling into disarray. This is a, a place of chaos where there is no moral hierarchy, um, where we, we can't separate good from bad. Um, and it's, it's, intrinsically corrupt. And the issue with corrupt governments is that they're self-perpetuating and they're degenerative, right? So if you put a hero or a good moral figure into a degenerative culture, the only way for them to win or to, to go up the hierarchy, if it's corrupt, is to just be more corrupt, right? To be the most corrupt. And that in its way is not helping to defeat the problem. And in this way, it's, it's sort of degenerative. Um, and uh, so what does he have to do? He has to defeat the corruption. So God says, okay, go to Nineveh, help um, you know, improve this culture, rebuild the culture. And Jonah says, absolutely not. Um, there's no way I'm going there. Why would I you know, bring myself to go have to go to this corrupt and awful place. And Peterson says, you know, that's the natural answer. If you know that the game is crooked, if you know that the game is rigged, if you know that it's corrupt, why would you want to play it? You know that it's do deemed to fail. Um, and that is, you know, just so self-evident of so much of the decisions that we have to make in life. Um, but on the contrary, we really have a sort of human ethical responsibility um, to, to fight that corruption and to do the best good possible. Um, Jonah doesn't wanna do it. He runs away, he goes into a ship, he sails away from his sailors, he's not gonna deal with this city, um, but it is necessary for Jonah to save the city. And so God sends a storm and that storm is important. The water, Peterson says, is a symbol for the unconscious. Um, and so out of that storm is where the monsters live. It's dark, we can't breathe there. And yet it's also the origin, right? Our cells are filled with water. 
Um, the storm comes, um, and really what we're starting to see here is this idea of it's really not a good idea to run away from your problems, from your destiny. It will always catch up to you. This calls to just basic procrastination. It will only make things worse. Um, you know, the farther you go, the stronger that storm gets. So the, the storm's getting really bad. Jonah's on his boat. Jonah is sleeping, which is significant. And his crew comes to wake him up and say, hey, wake up, there's a big issue. And Jonah instantly is kind of like, okay, this is all my fault. I knew this was coming. This is my fault. Uh, God is mad at me. Um, and the, there's kind of an interaction. The crew says to pray. They all pray about it. They cast lots. And they really all come to the conclusion that Jonah is at fault. They throw him overboard. And suddenly the ocean is calm. And then a whale comes up and swallows Jonah. Um, and that whale is the dragon, right? That is the, the place of chaos, that dark belly of the whale. It's filled with stomach acid. It's not realistic at all, right? And yet we know what that means because the, the meaning is so, so, so true and deep within our history. Um, so what happens when we go into the belly of the whale, when we when we face that dragon, is we we realize we've fallen off the, the path, right? And it produces this internal state of chaos and worry. We do not know what to do. And suddenly our kind of threat detector, our mind um, is 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 uh completely turned on, right? Because these monsters, they lurk in the dark. Um, Peterson kind of has an aside here that uh, kids are afraid of the dark and people say, oh, kids shouldn't be afraid of the dark. But Peterson is like, no, monsters lurk in the dark, right? The predators are nocturnal. We can't see well in the dark. Kids have evolved to know if they stay near the fire, they'll be safe. If they go off of, oh, far away from the fire, those are the ones that didn't evolve, right? They didn't make it. Um, and so we have all these circuits mentally to defend against predators, to help us when we enter these moments of chaos. Um, and when we go into what Peterson is referring to as the sort of mythological logical underworld. So when you go there, um, what happens? Well, how do you get out of it, right? What Peterson is saying, the way to sort of get out of this body of the whale is when you, you really need to parse out everything that you did to get yourself there. And in Jonah's case, it meant going to Nineveh and fighting corruption, getting back on the path. Um, so Peterson says, really, if the world isn't turning out what you want, something was wrong, the match between your actions and your presuppositions. And so what we need to do to kind of get out of the, the belly of the whale is examine ourselves for those action patterns that got us there that are not serving us well, learn from them and improve them go back to that place where the terrible event, unpack them, and then drop the bad parts and retain the parts that, um, you know, the best parts of ourself. And so um, this sort of avoidance being swallowed by the whale and then, you know, seeding out how we got there, parsing out the different pieces of it, herein lies um, sort of the transformation. So I'm going to pause here. We're going to go next into this kind of Harry Potter stories, St. George and the Dragon going into chaos. Um, but let's pause and talk a little bit about um, Jonah. Excellent. So, uh, so folks, um, now uh, many of you have watched the video. Many of you are familiar with the story. You're also familiar with the general theme of the power of the stories and the recurring you know, recurring themes in the story and what stories and mythologies and what they speak about the nature of human beings. So that is the topic, you know, the nature of stories and the story of Jonah and the whale. Um, to make any comments or ask questions about these things, you can type an exclamation mark in Zoom. You've got four rules. First, type exclamation mark in order to speak or ask questions. Number two, keep on topic. Number three, be brief. Number four, be courteous. Speak your mind. Feel free to disagree with anything, but do so courteously. All right. 
who'd like to go first? Um, let's start with Aaron, followed by Pegor. Aaron, you're next. All right, uh, very nice job, Claire. Uh, the thing that I'm seeing with Jonah and the whale and the way I interpret this is that it's also at this level of, we each have a purpose or meaning that we need to fulfill in our life. And you, know, you could believe that that comes from a God or you could believe that that comes from internally. And when Jonah gets swallowed by the whale, that's also equivalent to us, like not waking out of bed and just rolling the covers over our heads and being like, yeah, I'm not waking up today. I'm not doing that special meaning or I'm not fulfilling that special purpose. And again, maybe, I don't know if that's exactly the Jewish slash Christian interpretation of that story, but that's, that's how I interpret it, that we all have meaning and we all have purpose. And when we're not waking out of bed and doing what we need to, we're pretty much just living and chilling in a whale. Excellent. Uh, thank you, uh, Aaron. Now, Pegor, you have, you have watched another presentation on Jonah and the whale. Yeah. So what did you find? Yeah, so I watched uh, a video by Jonathan Pajot about uh, Jonah, Jonah and the Whale story. And uh, the title of the video is a re really weird one. It's like Jonah and the Whale, the upside down world. And the point that uh, Jonathan Pajot makes is that the Jonah story is sort of a, like an upside down story. So initially we have, let's say, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. And that's like the fall of human beings which is like you start off in the garden and then you fall further down the out of the garden down the mountain all the way to the edge of the world and then with the story of jonah it's sort of the reverse you start at the bottom of the world in the in the belly of the whale and then you move slowly up the up the world uh, up towards the garden so uh, so according to peugeot like uh, traditionally, like the West is is uh, associated with death because that's where the sun sets, the night comes, and East is sort of associated with light and sort of I guess the the top of the mountain, the Garden of Eden. And so initially, what Jonah does is he heads towards death. So so God offers him go to Nineveh, and Nineveh was to the east of where he was. And so God tells him like go to the east, go towards the mountain, go towards the garden. And Jonah refuses. He he goes towards the he goes towards death. And when he takes the boat, again, Jonathan points out like the upside down version. So in, in, in Noah's story, Noah was the pure person and uh, he was on the boat to, to be sort of the savior, you know, whereas in, 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 in Jonah's story, he's the cause of the flood, you know, so, so it's sort of like an upside down version of the arc narrative, you know, and, and like even so like on the boat, all the sailors, they're praying to their gods, and he's the only one who's not praying to his god. So it's the, whereas he's the one with the quote unquote proper god, you know? And then so, and then he's thrown, he says like, throw me overboard. And then he spends uh, three days in the belly of the beast, which is similar again, for example, with, with Jesus and all of that. And, and then he, co he comes back and he starts his journey east towards the garden of, of Eden. And the interesting thing is that, again, for example, when he arrives in Nineveh, it says that it takes him three days to cross the city from one end to the other. And then, and then so after he tells the city, like, uh, repent, you're going to be destroyed, uh, he leaves the city, and then God decides not to destroy the city. And that sort of upsets uh, Jonah, like, why did you do this to me? And then what happens is uh, Jonah goes out into the desert. He was like, oh, I'm going to die. Just I, I don't want to live anymore. And then as he falls asleep, uh, God let, lets a plant grow on top of him. And then the next day he wakes up and he's again upset and he says he wants to die. And then the, the, the plant dies. And, and then Jonah is upset that the plant is dead. And then God tells him, like, you're upset that the plant is dead, but you're, uh, you know, but like I saved so many people, like, What's going like you're you're valuing a plant more than uh, like a whole city. So it's it's this completely weird upside down thing. And as he heads further east from uh, Nineveh, we like before when he falls asleep, we, we hear the story of like the wind and the sun were are hitting him. And that's exactly sort of the reverse of creation, where like God blew into the earth, he shaped like a statue, and then he blew life into it, which is the wind and the light. So it's like this reverse. Uh, fall from Eden, Jonah's story. It's the climb up the mountain rather than the fall down the mountain. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Pegor, for that. 
Uh, next up is Hiro, uh, followed by John. Hiro, go ahead. Hey, I, uh, that was a, a interesting presentation, and what got me uh, thinking was uh, uh, when jo Jordan Peterson uh, uh, talks about the we hold these issues uh, to be self-evident, and and he said something about that even though they're really not uh, scientifically provable that something based on uh, can you sorry uh Hiro, your sound is going in and out oh can, can you uh or whoever elaborate on on even though it says that we hold these truths enough uh, like what is it? What would it require Sorry, scientific um, proof to be true? Uh, let, let me let me hand it over to Claire. I don't know how uh, uh, Claire. I did not catch yeah. much, but go ahead. I don't know if this is going to answer your question, but I'll I'll say some stuff and and we can go from there. So the, uh, that let me let me just let me just do one thing. Hiro, if you could type your question in the chat, that would help because we could barely hear. Uh, you know, he, uh, we, we lost many parts of what you said. Uh, go ahead, Claire. So the line, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, Peterson is calling that sort of an axiom of faith. So the idea here is that we're, we're holding these truths to be self-evident because they better be for society to, to exist, but there is no way to really prove them from science that all men are created equal from one another. Um, and Peterson's going to elaborate on this a lot more um, as he talks talks about just, um, you know, the, 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 the realm of psychology and, and depression, for example, you can't parse out the parts of depression that interact with our jobs and our relationships and our point in society, as well as the mental chemistry going on. Those two things are so entangled that while you can prove one element through science, you can't, you know, there's a piece of it that is just self-evident that we just have to, uh, you know, understand the relationship with others. So, um, you know, these myths, these stories, we take them to be true, or Peterson is saying really we should, but what is that definition of true, right? Um, was Jonah swallowed by a whale and spit back out and, and survived? Probably not. It would be cool if, if that were true, but it is true because the meaning is, and we know that meaning when we see it immediately. Uh, sorry, next up is uh, John. Uh, Hiro, your sound is terrible, so if you could type your question in, that would help. Uh, John, go ahead. Hi. Um, great presentation, Claire. Um, so, yeah, I guess this, so there's a couple of things. One is I really liked when Peterson talked about sort of these being sort of meta stories and that they're uh, basically we don't really know where a lot of these came from. They sort of just were evolved over time and told through oral traditions and that there's something about them that transcends storytelling itself. And I think Jonah and the whale is like one of these stories where all the fat, has, I think he says all the fat has been cut out. Um, and uh, one of the things I think this story is about, at least for me, is it seems to be something about avoiding, avoiding your calling or avoiding what's meaningful, right? So God comes to, God is talking to this guy and he says, hey, there's this city they're not doing, they're kind of corrupt and I need you to go sort it out. It's sort of like probably the most, you know, if you could think of like something that's like the most meaningful calling you could have is when God, like the most powerful force in the universe tells you to go sort out a city and he sort of wants to avoid it. And I think there's something where he goes to avoid it and chaos engulfs him, right? So I see the whale is almost like this, like literally engulfs him. And there's, I think there's something about uh, and this is sort of to the extreme, right? It's sort of like, here's here's society, it's being corrupt. This man, you know, wants to go, God wants him to go sort it out, but he says, no, I'm going to go in the ocean and go the other way. And chaos finds him. And I think there's something, I think there's the lesson there is that when you sort of avoid what's meaningful or what, and I, I could sort of, you could sort of take God, 
you know, if we're the religious belief and say maybe that voice inside you that sort of that sort of reminds you there's something meaningful, right? We all we all have that sense that okay, there's something meaningful over there, and a lot of times our our inclination is to run the other way because <laughs> it's sort of often unpleasant to deal with meaningful things. So I see this as sort of like uh, like a, a, a an extreme version of that, and and that when you avoid what is meaningful, you often wind up in chaos. Um, but I think I'll just end with that. I think Peterson, at one point he says, this is almost inevitable and in that we we are constantly like, we sort of have to learn this the hard way a lot of times. I think he says those words is like, you know, we often do things that are stupid and we get thrown into chaos and we have to sort it out. And sometimes we don't sort it out. So um, yeah, I really enjoyed this, um, this sort of telling of, of Jonah and I think it has a lot of lessons in it. Claire, go ahead. You had a yeah, comment? yeah, and I think it's a great point because you know that saving corruption in the city. To your point, that's there very intentionally because it is of high meaning to society. You know, to that to that culture overall, um, and that and to, it, very well said. Those are the things often that we need to be focusing on. And Peterson says, you know, life is so hard and awful that the only way to really make it worth it, worth your time in the end, um, and the pain is to be focusing on that which which provides the most meaning. Um, so uh, a great reminder. Thanks, John. Next up is Steve. Um, <clears throat> Claire, great job. I love the sharing. I love uh, Jordan Peterson's approach to life. He's just so practical, maybe because He's not only, I think, for, he's worked hard at being a genius. It took him 15 years to write that book, Maps of Meaning. But because he's been a practical psychologist working with family issues, he seems to have this real practical down-to-earth approach. And in that regard, I love the way he tackles Jonah and the whale and his other archetypal stories that come through our traditions. I really enjoyed the other person, I can't remember who it was, who shared another version of the story. Begor. Uh, yeah, I like that story too, because there's a lot of elements there that, that uh, Jordan Peterson didn't focus on. And I think there are a lot of invitations in that whole thing, like traveling east out of uh, after the issue's done and which direction we're going in. That's really important. I really like the idea. I don't know who brought it up, but that this is a the story of Joan and the Whale is a story of me getting up in the morning, looking at my day and just wanting to pull the covers over my day and say, screw it. I ain't going there. I don't want to get up today. I think that is the real power of this story. And then to take Joseph's comment one step further, and I think what Claire said, I'd like to bring something up. I mean, it's not about God showing up in our lives and saying out of the clear freaking blue, hey, Nineveh sucks. Go fix it. I think that that voice of God and has been alluded to here, is really just your conscience and my conscience. I think that probably if we knew the backstory on, on Jonah, he could have been a, on the city council of Nineveh and saw all the corruption and knew exactly how terrible it was. And it's, it's his con the voice of God is this conscience, this part of me that when I get up in the morning, I don't wanna face all this crap, I'm leaving town. I'm quitting my job as a council member, I'm leaving town. I just am uh, gonna avoid this corruption I'm going to avoid life. And I, I love all the points that have been brought out. And I just thought I would say that. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Steve. Uh, great point. Um, I want to say that, you know, most of these stories are kind of dramatization of what goes on in the psyche. So absolutely. I mean, this is like something that you ought to do, you don't do. You go do something else. So that is something else is go out on the sea then the whale is just your own subconscious, you know, your own guilty conscience, uh, which just envelops you and you are kind of stuck there until you can figure it out. So it is very much of a kind of psychology, psychological, inner psychological dra drama uh, presented using the metaphors uh, of external, external things. Uh, next up is um, Pegor followed by Joe. Yeah, so I just, uh, I want to add one point to that uh, sort of interpretation, which I think is important. Uh, Pegor, could you speak more into the mic? Yeah, is it better now? Much better. 
Yeah, so I, I, as I was saying, I wanted to, I remembered something that I forgot to mention, which I think is relevant to our times today, which is Jonathan Peugeot also mentions that in the story of Jonah, there's a sort of an, uh, so like, we, we all know this idea of the center and the margin. And like, everyone has this idea that the center is sort of the people who are on the margin, they're sort of excluded, they're left out, they're the stranger. And, and somehow, maybe even like, we tend to demonize those on the margin, and sort of look at them as if they're lower than us. And so what Peugeot points out in this story is that the people on the margin can also sort of be connected to God. And so as long as you are connected to God, as long as there's a connection there, it's fine. And he points out in the story is that Nineveh was the enemy of sort of the, the Jews, you know, and yet God asks Jonah to go and save the stranger. And again, sort of when, when they're on the boat, it's the foreign sailors who, who are sort of the good guys, you know, and they're, they're invoke, they, they pray to their gods asking for, they, they admit that, what, you know, maybe we've done something wrong to anger the gods, we need to fix this, you know, and so, and so the idea, one of the other sort of uh, meanings behind the story is that even if you are on the edge of society, even if you're on the edge of the world, if you maintain the connection with the higher being, you're, you're good, you know, and so even, and so those at the center should not look down upon those on the edge, because people at the edge have their role and people on the in the center have their role. And the edge cannot exist without the center and the center cannot exist without the edge. Okay, Claire, if I may, I want to comment on this. I want to connect it to another meetup that we are doing. Um, we're doing a meetup on Buckminster Fuller's book. It's a very short book. It's 44 pages of PDF, free PDF that is available. It's going to be next Wednesday. It's, uh, his book is called The Operations uh, Manual for Spaceship Earth. And there he has a very interesting take on the edge and the centers. He says that most of the value, this is before the First World War, um, most of the value in civilization was created by these intrepid seafaring people, people who chose to take to the sea, figured out how to navigate, figured out how to visit different people, figured out how to trade with them, uh, figured out what value would be of value to other people, whereas most people remained fixed. So the people who were fixed, so it's, it's the edge which created a lot of value because that's where new value creation takes place. If when you are kind of stuck in an ordered place, you're not actually creating the value. You are at best, you are just keeping the value that was created earlier um, decay very slowly. Uh, whereas most of the value is created by people at the edge. And he has this very, you know, I've, I've just begun reading it. It's incredible. But just in the first few pages, this view, of the value of words. I also want to say that, you know, coming back to America, verge is a key idea in America. It is the frontier. It is the idea that there is something open there and something that is possible. You don't know what it is, but you have the courage, you have the uh, ability to kind of go there and explore, uh, which is really the core uh, part of American spirit that makes makes us different. So the next next up is going to be Joe. Joe, go ahead. Um, my question is somewhat simple. You know, it, it's simple. I, I need to go back and watch the videos. I, I didn't have an opportunity this week, so um, I apologize. But the idea, I mean, is Jonah a hero? In this story, I mean, that's what I really kind of can't get through my um, and just listening to the commentary this evening is that, you know, is he a hero, or hero and, you know, does he even have a choice to make in this particular instance? I mean, that's that's another point that I would just like to ask Claire. Yeah, I think the first he absolutely is the hero. Um, and I, you know, I think that a great example of just sort of not all heroes are are the sort of brute force, um, you know, with sword wielding King George. Um, and so I think that the first sort of heroic 
decision he makes is when he tells his crew, hey, I think I did this. Um, and I think we have to sacrifice me to, to, for you all. Um, and that really in itself is heroic, the, the sea's calm. And then I think the real um, triumph is getting out of that belly of the whale and, and going back to Nineveh. Um, and I think Pegor really explained much more depth about what that transformation is. I think that's one, Peterson tells a lot about the beginning of the story and not as much about the important part, um, which is getting out. But I do know just from Peterson's psychology that you know, when you're in that darkness, when you're in that belly, the way out is in parsing through what got you there. Um, and, you know, Peterson has similar advice for someone going through a breakup of like, or any post-traumatic stress, you know, symptoms of parse out what happened, really go into each element of the situation and what made you feel good, stay with those and look at those more deeply. Um, and so why was, um, was Jonah avoiding this? What what was what was painful for him in 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 facing that which has the highest meaning, and confronting that and going back there to face it is really important. And so we'll talk about this more in the next story. But that I you know coming back into the realm of order with that which you've accomplished that transformation is really kind of the the heroic element here. But a really great question. Any other thoughts from the peanut gallery? Uh, let me see. I think uh, Laura has a question and Vyom has a question. And then we will go ahead uh, to the second section. Laura, go ahead. Yeah, it wasn't so much a question. It's just sort of a perceptual thing, probably too modernized. But I feel like he's, it's like a rapid, very fast film at, of a life you know, life compressed, what are, what, who we are, our emotions, what we do, how we function, and wear different hats and different coats and different personalities. And he sort of compressed it. And this little, you know, Jonah takes on all these different formations and gets into, you know, I don't know how to say it exactly, other than I just saw it in my mind that way, like a, you know, almost like a very early kind of film, you know, and it's almost like a Charlie Chaplin kind of characterization. Um, Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laura. So next up is Vyom, followed by Mike. Vyom, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, I I'm really interested to, to see what... Uh, uh, Vyom, could you speak into the mic? Yeah, uh, I'm really interested to see more about what Peterson says, but uh, a lot of it... Uh, 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 mythology, I think, is about, as, as Srikanth also said, is about the self. And I think as uh, each of us have the hero in ourselves, and I think that's what mythology and most of it tries to say, that there's, each of us is a hero and, uh, you know, we don't necessarily have a choice uh, to fight the dragons. Uh, they will come back to us irrespective of, uh, and if we try to avoid one, the other, another one will come up. So I guess that's the question I have. I don't know if, if, if any of us has a choice. And I think that to a large extent is life. And I think the myths are kind of trying to touch back on that. Uh, so I'm, I'm really interested in this topic more. Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely agree that we don't all have a choice. Often we are thrust into these situations that force us to face the meaning. Um, but, you know, not everyone is, is lucky enough to to experience that in their lifetime. And really Peterson does hold that, you know, venturing out into chaos is a, is an, is, is morality that supersedes the naivety if you never leave, right? That that really isn't uh, a, an area of morality if you haven't ventured out and been forced into that situation. So um, I think absolutely often, you know, and the darkest chaos is the one that you weren't expecting, right? The one that came out of nowhere and the one that doesn't fit in with your, your current map of the world. Um, that's, you know, those are the times that we really need to have these tools to be ready for. So Claire, I just want to say, I want to plug the, uh, you know, uh, Buckminster Fuller's ver version of it, because what he's saying is that if you are actually a seafaring trader going from city to city, so you're basically riding on chaos and connecting up points. So it's like, like 
you know, the, for example, the way in which Jordan Peterson conceptualizes it, you start from order, you go into chaos and come back to order. What Buckminster Fuller is saying is that if you want to have a much more ambitious thing, ambitious goal, you are a seafaring person who is, who is going to all these little islands of chaos, a little islands of order, and you're connecting them because they have a very narrow view of themselves. And by trading with all of them, you kind of uplift everything and you, and your home is the sea. So you're home, you're, you're at home with chaos. That's a, that's, that's, I, I find it amazingly profound view of human beings, because what it is saying is that growth is natural. It's not something that you, you know, that you have to say, okay, I have to now do this. But that's uh, okay. Just wanted to say that. Um, next up is Mike, followed by John. Mike. Uh, some uh, relative points uh, that uh, uh, Jonah's the story of Jonah got honorable mention in uh, Joseph Campbell's work too. Uh, uh, the story of Jonah. Jonah is one of about three or four, maybe four prophets that was were actually were actually mentioned uh, in the story of Jesus uh, and there are parallels to uh, to the story to that story uh, there's also a um, uh, St. Augustine and uh, uh, Campbell uh, described uh, parallels to other stories like Gilgamesh and Jason of uh, the golden fleece in uh, uh, in uh, in Greek mythology, so uh, it, it's interesting that he was one of the few people uh, who uh, who argued with God and uh, kind of had a uh, a good ending to it. Uh, mm -hmm. Although you could say he's dead and buried in uh, in uh, Nineveh, but uh, his tomb is memorialized. So the, it's a complex story. Uh, there are some authors who uh, there are uh, some authors who say that uh, it, it's a parable and a myth, and that Jonah didn't really exist, and that included Martin Luther. So I'm not sure where all that goes, but uh, uh, a, a number of people besides uh, you and Peterson uh, have. Uh, immortalized him as some, somebody we could learn from. Thank you, Mike. Uh, last one is, uh, uh, Claire, do, did you, if you want to respond to anything, just go ahead and speak, okay. Okay, uh, next up is John. Yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, so about like the choice in chaos, I sort of think there's like, there's, you do have, you do have a choice and you don't have a choice, right? This is the way I read it anyway, is that you don't have a choice that you have to confront chaos, right? But we're sort of fallible humans in that we delude ourselves and thinking we do have a choice and when given ourselves a choice, we will avoid it if possible. And so we, we don't have a choice that we have to confront chaos, chaos but we, I feel we do have a choice that of how we confront it or when we confront it. So, and I think the story for me of Jonah and the whale is that when you sort of hold off chaos, it's going to sort of bounce back harder. <laughs> and so probably it's better to confront chaos when it's manageable rather than when it consumes us. Um, but again, it goes back to the thing where Peterson says is that we're also like young and, you know, when we're young and foolish, and, and we don't know this, we have to learn the hard way. Um, and so we were continually learning that we can't avoid chaos, that it's gonna consume us and we have to deal with it. And so it's almost like part of the gig. <laughs> so it's like, there's like two stories going on at the same time. Um, but I just wanted to add that, that uh, point. Thanks. And that's also just, you know, classic coming of age story, right? That we will be forced yeah. to these learnings um, and come, you know, come out of it with some sort of pilgrimage accomplished and some understand, better understanding of the world. Okay, last one um, is David. David, go ahead. 
Yeah, this, this is great because the Jonah story always, I don't know, it's always, no pun intended, uh, murky. Uh, even when I was a kid, it was so murky. Like, um, and some things are starting to come together, but still is murky. Uh, but just, you know, what I'm hearing, when, when you avoid the call of duty, um, you'll be devoured by the chaos of your own unconscious. Um, and then, so the whale is, you know, that, that chaos living within the unconscious. Then there was the mention of St. George and the dragon. So, and there, of intentionality and sort of circumstance. So the dragon is, uh, in, this is Campbell. The dragon is part snake, part bird. It's earth and it's sky. Um, St. George goes in and intentionally engages the dragon. Jonah is forced into having to engage with the whale. The whale lives beneath the surface. The whale is part fish. Well, I mean, we know it's a mammal because of science, but it's part fish, but it breathes. So it's like this hybrid creature as well. Um, so these sort of inversions there also, below the surface, above the surface hybrid, hybrid, but different types of hybrids. So yeah, I just wanted to throw those into the conversation. Um, and this is, this is fascinating, so thanks a lot. Yeah, I think that's a really perfect segue to our next story because you do see these in contrast. And even, um, you know, Joseph was asking earlier, is this a, is he the hero defeating chaos? And I think what we're seeing here is the the importance of consciousness, as you alluded to, is huge here. That this is an awakening. It's 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 coming to consciousness, it's that eye-opening experience. And while there is a defeat and a kind of rebirth. Um, element, you know, that's, it's not as strong as in the next stories that we're going to talk about. And King George is really the classic example there. So I think you, you just, the way you described it was so good of this kind of the chaos of your unconscious. And I think that that facing that being thrust on you really does um, personify the story. And, and I agree, murky is a good explanation, is a good description of it. And I think one reason is this, this combination of a lot of stories thing, right? That a lot of these stories just feel very bizarre. Um, and it's because who knows how many other myths this thing is incorporating. And that's pretty, pretty cool. Um, so let's move on. Um, Shrikant, is that cool? Yep. Okay, this one is going to be fun. So this is just your classic going into defeat of chaos, dragon defeating story. Um, and St. George is the real classic one, but the one that Peterson goes into detail with in this lecture, and I think is just fun because it's more recent for us, is Harry Potter. Um, and a really wonderful example because it is dripping with mythology, and yet, you know, it's it's less than, you know, within the last couple of, couple of decades. So let's talk about it. So this is the Hobbit. This is Harry Potter. This is St. George. This is your classic um, defeating of the dragon. Um, so first you take a wizard living in a magic castle. First of all, Peterson is like, okay, we just take that and we understand it, which is odd, um, but we do. And Harry Potter is born to bad parents, right? He has these muggle parents and really that they represent sort of bad parents everywhere. They are everything that sums up evil. Um, sorry, Claire, sorry, Claire, for, the, for, for people uh, who are big Harry Potter fans, they are not his parents. They are, you know, his parents died, so. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But those are the good parents. Yes, yes. But he's yes. Sorry. Oh gosh, we're gonna deal with some some fans here. I'll be I'll tread carefully. Um. So he's born to parents. Well, okay. Y you you find him with parents who are bad parents. Um. They're really I you know iconic bad parents. There's this Dudley kid, and he's just really the epitome of selfishness and immorality. Um, but we know that he has these idealized parents, right? These are the perfect version of, of the ideal in both men and female um, and male. And when we meet Harry with these awful family, he is constantly punished for that which we know is his most virtuous traits, right? He's punished for being good. He's punished for any potential of magic. Um, and there's a big parallel here to the Jesus story, which is brought up earlier. Um, so take religion out of it. You have in Jesus, someone who was punished in the highest way 
or you know the most evil awful way that you could imagine for having the most highest possible virtue right so he got the most bad thing from the most good thing and here i mean it's weird it just gave me goosebumps saying that like there is something so appalling to that idea um, and so we feel really bad for Harry. We know that there's something really wrong. Um, so he goes off to wizarding school, which we totally accept as being normal. And Peterson is saying that this is calling to sort of this, the liberal arts idea that in this school, what it's really doing is calibrating Harry or situating him properly within life. Um, and so he gets here, this is sort of his coming of age, his um, his education. He immediately goes into the sorting hat scene where we really are, are seeing him in that moment decide, okay, he puts on the hat, are you part of the good house or the bad house? And the hat takes a really long time to figure that out because in this virtuous hero of Harry, there is a part of evil and there's he has a piece of Voldemort in him. Um, and so this is so purely union, right? that within each of us, we have our own sh shadow. Um, and uh, and we have to understand that part of ourselves and, and um, come to terms with it and harness it for good. Um, Peterson you know, calls to the classic sort of, you, we have to understand our own proclivity to be a guard in the Holocaust. Like, you know, humans are innately evil. We all have a potential of shadow within us, us and facing that or really seeing that is a requirement of morality. Um, so if you regard yourself as harmless, I'm just nice, I'm totally harmless, I'm just a nice person, um, you're not a saint because you have no reason to be moral. There's no impetus. Naivety is not morality, Peterson says. Um, human beings are really vicious creatures and we have to understand our own you know, part of that. So um, in the second volume, as Peterson says, um, Harry goes down into the dungeons to defeat the snake. Right. This is the basilisks. This is the dragon. This is evil. Um, he goes down to do it into the underworld that again is very symbolic. Um, he's going into chaos. Um, and uh, what does he do? This snake comes out. He looks at the snake and it freezes you. And this is a call to Medusa or ancient Greek, Greek mythology. Um, it's, fight, it's fight or fright. It also has its origins in evolutionary biology. So humans evolved in, in trees. We were small people. We lived and slept in trees with snakes that could not only kill us, but eat us and swallow us. And so Peterson says that, that from that, we really evolved this amazing eyesight, which is one of our best qualities. Um, there's been studies done on I want to say it was chimps or like, I don't know, primates that live in areas with more snakes can see better, right? That we've, we've really evolved to see snakes. And so this snake freezes us. We've that fight or flight mechanism that freezes up um, and um, it bites us. It bites Harry. And that's not really what we wanted to happen to our hero. It's not what we expected. But Peterson says it's true that when you voluntarily go into chaos, you will, you know, you there's a potential that you will get bit. And that's something that we have to understand. And that's true. Um, there's a kind of a, a gender motif here that I want to unpack around here. Why does he go down there? He has to go res rescue Ginny, Ginny's full name, Ginevra. So there is a virgin uh, illusion here, Re you know, same thing, St. George rescuing the kind of sleeping beauty up in the castle. This is a really classic archetype. Um, so he has to go, you know, save this virginal creature. What is that call to Peterson hypothesizes that possibly, you know, as we evolved and uh, alongside predators, you know, who was the one that was fending off the predators from the tribe, probably the, the men, right? And, and from that, okay, if the guy is able to fend us off from predators the most, that guy becomes pretty popular, he's good at it. And here evolves that kind of um, defeating dragon, saving virgin kind of motif. Um, Peterson says, if you're the sort of person who can stand up against the unknown, others will most likely find you attractive. That's um, kind of goes without saying. 
Um, so then Peterson gets bit, right? Um, he goes to rescue Jenna, he's poisoned. Um, and what is the only thing that can revive him um, is of course our God creature or Dumbledore or the King. Again, as you guys have already said, this isn't religious God, it's the Logos. It could be within ourselves. Um, and Dumbledore happens to have a Phoenix, which is a pretty awesome and convenient thing to have. Um, so what does a Phoenix do? It rises from the ashes. Um, and Dumbledore's particular Phoenix has like a life expectancy, I don't know, 10 years or something, and it lives and then it just whittles into the ashes and is reborn. Um, and this is important. Uh, it's not easy. It's not pleasant, right? And so from being born, from disintegrating the ashes and coming out of it, it's, Peterson says like, no one likes the day where they learned a good lesson. It's a it's a transformative day, but you didn't enjoy it very much. It wasn't helpful. Um, but herein lies the real power. And so um, the the you know the only thing that will save Harry from his poison and from this fight is the tear of that phoenix. And so that transformative quality going into the depth and pulling yourself back out. Um, saves him and uh, saves Ginny um, also. So in order to, you know, the, the resolution of this is really a massive transformation. And Peterson says that the person that comes out on the other end, in Harry's case, you know, we're going to follow him on a coming of age journey. He's going to be prepared for the Triwizard Tournament in the next book and then um, a ball. Um, so we're, you know, we're watching him progress and learn these lessons, but there is in, in this story with the basculus, there's a massive transformation that takes place. And you might not recognize that person when you go to defeat the dragon. Um, you know, in Peterson uses the example of alcoholics that often when someone removes alcohol from their life, it's not as simple as just removing that beverage right? You need to stop seeing all of your friends. You have to unpack your dynamics with your family, and you have to figure out something to do with the 20 hours a day, a week that you spend drinking. And so often when you see people recover from alcoholism, that is a radically different person um, than previously. And that's what the Phoenix is. Um, so Peterson says, well, okay, great. Sorry. Why is this rational to people? Why was Harry Potter such a huge success? Um, and the answer to Peterson, as we've already said, is because this is a myth, because this is a meta story that we understand intrinsically without needing to know what a Dumbledore or a Hufflepuff or any of this is. We understand that core story. Okay. Um, so shall we, uh, so this is the end of the second session or the third session? Second session and the third one will be quick. Third one will be quick. Okay. Um, would you prefer to just then finish the third one and then we can open it up for questions? Yep, let's do that. Okay. Okay, so so we've gone through our big stories, and this is this is getting a little bit maps of meaning -y, so bear with me, but I'm gonna do it badly. So how then do we act in the world? If we've already said what, you know, that science tells us what the world is made of, then how do we then decide how to act into the world? Um, so Peterson says, when you go see a therapist, um, what therapists are really doing is, is they're mostly trying to help you get your life together. Right. And so all, you know, mental disorders are also, as I, as I said earlier, they're connected with your life um, in, in the ways that you interact with, with your environment and with relationships, um, et cetera. So, um, you know, categories of things in general, and especially in nature, they aren't simple. And so in order to understand, Peterson says, the categories of myths, we have to understand the nature of category categories in themselves. Um, and, you know, what makes two separate things the same, Peterson says, is just similarity within them. Um, and it's it's specific, it's specifically difficult with personality disorders um, because you don't always have all of them. So he uses the example of DSM categories. Um, so categories of of let's say antisocial behavior. Um, you know, there's eight symptoms of antisocial behavior. You can you can be antisocial and have symptoms two to five or five or three to eight. 
right? So you don't need to have them all because we can't capture all of kind of mental health with any consistency across all individuals. We can only capture this kind of crossover amalgamation. And so categories in this way are really complex. So where then do we aim? How do we learn how to act? Well, we're gonna use these stories. We need to rely on them, especially when we're in the belly of the whale because that's history that already did the work for us. Um, so um, Peterson says, first of all, we need to orient ourselves and aim up. He brings in, in this part of the lecture, that classic kind of like, here's a blob, here's another blob, you're heading toward your aim, and then there's all sorts of other things and obstacles. And so um, when we are aiming at something and what you're aiming at is very, very fundamentally important. Um, Peterson brings up the gorilla experiment that we've talked about when we talked about 12 rules for life. So classic experiment, you bring some people in the room and you tell them to watch how many, how many times someone throws a ball back and forth and they're counting the ball being thrown back and forth. And then they also, while this is happening, send a man in a gorilla suit through the frame and they ask afterwards, how many times was the ball thrown? And they know, and they say, did you see the man in the gorilla suit? And they're like, no. And what this starts to show is that human vision, first of all, we can't see any of our peripheral vision, right? We can only really see the one thing in front of us that we're looking at. And even then what we're focusing on um, is what we see and it, it inflates our perception in that way. Um, and how do we determine what you focus on? Well, some of it is, is hard work and focus and intentionality, but as we all know, some of it mostly is just what we want, right? It is intrinsically tied up with our value systems um, and this kind of framework of perception is really, an, is, is it illusionary? So, you know, in a way, yes, everything is an illusion, but my illusion is quite different than yours, right? And that difference is sort of what makes the illusion in all. So um, you have to aim somewhere, that's point A, um, or you have to be somewhere, that's point A, and you always have to aim somewhere, that's point B. Um, your attention is the thing that you can control. Um, you know, well, it's mostly in control. You could try to control it, but it really sort of has this own autonomy. Um, so as you're heading toward point B, you see two types of things. You see tools to use to help you move to point B more quickly. Those make you happy. And you see obstacles. Those make you unhappy. And they make you unhappy for two reasons. One, it's just an obstacle. You got to get over it. It's going to help. It's going to, you're going to have to get to point B a little slower now. And two, and more more tragically, it might mean that your entire frame was wrong, right? That obstacle might actually be a different side of your frame. And now you have to reorient your pathway to get to point B. And that's why those obstacles that get us there um, are particularly anxiety producing because now I also kind of have to redo my map. And that involves me going backwards and figuring out what other presuppositions I built I built on top of my flawed map. And that is not a fun aha moment to have. So when people look at the world, and this is core, we talked about this in 12 rules. When we look at the world, we see value first, we don't see objects. So when you see a cliff, you don't say, oh, that's a cliff. Oh, I could fall. Oh, I'm scared. You immediately see the cliff and you say, that's a falling off place, right? That, that moment comes right as you recognize the thing. When you see a chair, you see something to sit in. When you see a, stu a stoop, you see something to sit on. But you know that those things are different, but they're both things to sit on. Um, let's see, where am I going from here? Um, so, so the, this, this world at being a tool, the world being something that we inhabit, this is a fundamental Darwinian idea. Um, and, and Peterson says that it's not self-evident that seeing, that, see, that seeing the world as objects is the way that the world works. What is more self-evident possibly is that we are wired for stories. That's a source of mythology and a source of truth. Um, and, and it, it, and it's, tightly aligned with the way that our psyches are constructed. Um, let's see. 
I think just the last thing I'll leave us on is, um, wow, there's so much here. Um, you know, uh, this is also um, reflected in our brains and in our, you know, the way our bodies are constructed. So there's two different hemispheres of the brain, but those two hemispheres are really independent. And what we realize is us as individuals, we're made up of many, many fragments. Peterson calls them many one-eyed giants. Um, and he uses the story that we can all relate with, with, you know, angry you comes out and does and says all these things. And then when normal you reappears, they're like, who was angry me? Like, how could I have said those things? That's not me. Um, and, and so in that way, we don't, we aren't one unit. We are, we are made of a system A and a system, system one, system two. Um, and we're, we're trying to navigate between those two. Um, so, um, Yeah, the last sort of themes here from a historical and mythological context um, are archetypes, and we will build a lot more on this when we get to Jung. Um, but there's a, you know, so many more archetypes that are embedded in different myths. Um, examples being, you know, mother, the mother earth, sort of this nature and feminine versus masculine male order and chaos. That's kind of a fundamental archetype tied up in mythology and history, um, but not necessarily tied to a certain story. Um, and so, you know, po postmodern, postmodernists would say that there's really no meaning outside of language, that language is what created the meaning to begin with. Well, what Peterson is really, um, you know, contrasting that with is, you know, first we had internalized thought. You don't need words to think. Um, and out of, the, you know, in and the hierarchies developed at the time of that internalized thought. Um, you know, they didn't develop after. And so mythology, it exists to tell that story and to represent it, um, but the, the, the archetypes, the themes, they existed, you know, far, far, far earlier. Um, and we will, we will end it with lobsters, which is the perfect example of this. Um, you know, lobsters live in a hierarchy. When you give a lobster an antidepressant after it loses um, a, a, a match or a lobster battle, if you give the losing lobster an antidepressant, it will feel better. It will be happy. Um, they will stand, it will stand up a little bit straighter. So how is it that this crustacean, which, you know, separated from humans so many millions of years ago, has you know a emotional structure that is tied up in uh, the hier the dominance hierarchy that it lives lives in. Well, that's something to pay attention to. So that which evolves the longest um, herein lies the, you know the mythology um, that we should lean on. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Claire. Um, so now let me let's open it up to questions and comments. So again type exclamation mark to, to speak, keep on topic, um, be brief and be courteous. So it's gonna be Pegor followed by John. Yeah, so I just wanted to point out that in the Harry Potter stories, Hogwarts is sort of a analogy to the Garden of Eden because it's like the safe place where all the students go, especially in the last battle. And then underneath the garden, you have the basilisk just the snake, the dragon of chaos, you know, all the bad stuff that are underneath the garden. And so, and as Claire mentioned in the second book, Harry Potter has to go down in, and confront the dragon underneath the school that is threat, threatening the school. You know, the snake that pops its head into the garden to ruin everything. Excellent. Next up is uh, John. Yeah, there was one part of the lecture that he touched on something that I thought was pretty profound, but he only touched on it briefly. And that was sort of about motivation. And at, at one point he says sort of like, okay, you're all, you know, he's teaching a class and all the students, you're all sitting there and you're all watching me. Like you're all sitting there quietly and you're watching me. Like, why are you doing that? Like, and this is sort of related to the part where like our ego, like we're sort of, we have very poor willpower. Like uh, when we, you know, when we don't want to eat sugar, or something, you know, 15 minutes later, we're, we're like 
eating chocolate chip cookies. He's like, we have very little control, but yet all these students are here sitting there quietly watching me when they could be doing all these other things with their time. And he ties it to basically, uh, from what I recall, it was sort of like, it's, it's the combined focus of narratives within our stories. Like, you know, uh, you know, uh, you are a student and you're going to college and you're going to get a good grade, get a good grade. You need to get a grade in this class so you can graduate. Why are you graduating? So you can get a job. Why do you want a job? So you can have a career, so you can have a better sort of, so your trajectory in life, so you can have, find a suitable partner. And so all these sort of goals and stories and narratives sort of align to motivate us to do something which is sort of in other circumstances it would seem nonsensical, right? Like why would you sit in a classroom uh, watching a guy just talk about, you know, whales and things. Like if you think of it without any context, it's nonsensical, but because of all these things, and it sort of just sort of struck to me that like, there is sort of like a tie in between our motivation to do these things and the stories with sort of the stories we, the narratives we see ourselves as a part of, and that these narratives can actually sort of the, 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 focus from these narratives can actually overlap to sort of increase their magnification. And I just, it was something you touched on really briefly, but it sort of struck me because I'm, I'm very curious about how, um, how this all fits into our motivation and us to get us to do these things, uh, to go to the, what is it, Nandor or whatever it's called, to, to like do that. It's like, it's, it's, a, it's a constant struggle. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to point out that one. Yeah, and there's something sort of repulsive when somebody acts in a way against that, right? And and I think the example he's used is like if someone in a lecture were to start get up and screaming and waving their arms all around, like that would make people really, really nervous because it's just not the way, you know, that's not the rules of the game that we're all playing. Um, so I, I, yeah, I think that that's also an example of why Peterson's ideas have blown up so heavily because they overlap all these different um, fields and stories in a way that we we pay attention to. Like it does have that aha moment for us. So next question is from Jairo. He asks, if we are wired for myths, does that wiring happen automatically somehow? Perhaps by a collective unconscious past lives or is it nurtured by culture? The classic question we can't get through through without thinking about this. Um, you know, it's both. It has to be both. I think, especially in this mythological context, there's a lot here that I think Peterson would say is ingrained um, in us. Um, you think of, you know, you know, babies start playing with dolls, you know, pretty immediately, or like, you know, there's these proclivities to imitate. Um, that you could say, okay, you're just imitating something the first few things that they saw. But um, I think Peter with Peterson would say that this is, you know, the hierarchy, for example, it's, it's th that which has existed for the longest amount of time has to be the most true possible thing because evolution weeds everything out, right? So if something exists for millions and millions of years, that thing has to be so profoundly true. And so that's where we get stories and, and hierarchies that Peterson would say are ingrained, are, are nature um, because they've existed for so long and we've kept them as we've evolved. Next up is going to be Maritza, Joe and Aaron. Maritza, go ahead. Hi, um, I I found the uh, the later um, tales uh, after um, Jonas and the Whale to be a, just a little bit more resonating with me. I, I was wondering, I I know that uh, Peterson says, you know, to be good, truly good, you can't just follow the rules. And so the implication is that you have to, I mean, you must take action. So, so he's saying um, to be able to understand malevolence, then you have to... Um, you know, see it within yourself. You have to acknowledge it within yourself and kind of embrace it and come to terms with it. Now, is that, is the corollary there with the previous story, the fact that you are, so, and 
what I got out of the previous, the Jonas and the Whales is that, you know, if you're threatened by something, you have to go to the mythological underworld when, you're, when your life falls apart. So, so if, is the aspect of going into this underworld, is, is that the aspects, that, the same aspect that's being implied when one is considering that one is facing one's internal like evil or malevolence in order to come out better on the other side? Yeah, I think they're entangled. Um, you know, chaos can take many forms. Uh, so I think there's a, there's a way in which your dragon could be whatever that internal struggle is, or that internal struggle is a symptom that you have to sort out in fighting your dragon. Um, so I think in that way, it's kind of both. Um, there's, there's an important element of sort of society is corrupt always, Peterson would say, that, that it's part of humans role to, you know, to fix that, right? And to suss out the parts of it that are, you know, it's tyrannical for a reason, because if every individual were allowed to do everything they wanted, it just wouldn't work, right? So we have to take away some individuality from everyone to, to and, it, and it is tyrannical, it has to be. And so part of us kind of facing that has to be um, weeding out the parts that sort of aren't and are. Um, so I don't think I exactly answered your question there, if anyone else wants to jump in here, but I think in, in the Jonah story, the chaos, um, you know, his facing chaos is, I, I guess it's, it's, it's the path of coming back, right? And going, and going back to the city and, and, and facing that challenge. I don't know. So I, if I, if I may just really, really quickly, um, I think I, I think what I hear you saying is that it's so that the chaos and the malevolence are both those things about ourselves that we may not want to admit to. And as such, they are, I can see how that would make them both the dragon then, because that's, that's what we have to face. Okay. It does. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Marisa. Next up is Joe, followed by Aaron. So I'm just briefly like kind of reading the text, uh, the transcript as, uh, you know, you're talking. So I, I, I just, um, and, and there's this distinction between the Phoenix that you touched upon and uh, the idea of the snake. Can you talk a little bit about that distinction that he makes in this lecture? Because I, as I'm just reading right now, he doesn't, I'm only halfway through. Uh, if you can go through that yep. a little bit. Okay, so guys, jump in here if I'm wrong. But the phoenix is the mythological representation of transformation. So, um, so it, so it is. It's almost the whole hero's journey in itself, right? So it's the thing that um, it's culture. It's strong. It evolves, and then anarchy, it's destroyed, and from it is rebuilt. It's this kind of circle of life element. And in that way, that's the only cure, that transformation for the bite of the snake. And I think in this place, the snake is really just symbolizing evil, chaos, dragon, Medusa. Um, it's, that, it's that which you want to defeat. Um, it, am I right there? Does anyone think I'm wrong? I don't no think objections. there are no objections. No objections. Good. <laughs> Next up. Your question, Joseph. I would like to add something it, here. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I would I would like to add something here, and that is the snake is also represented in the caduceus. It's the energy that rolls up the spine in the in the in the uh, in the chakra diagrams. And there's one snake and another snake. And so I, I think that's an important metaphor in this context. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up is Aaron. Yeah, guys, I, I kind of want to make this maybe a little bit more concrete 
maybe maybe if we if we took it down to that level and I'm thinking that in real life, it's not quite like Jonah. It's not quite like Harry Potter. Again, I've never really read Harry Potter, but in all of these kind of narratives, like God or some force takes the protagonist and like drags them by the hand to where they need to be, you know? So it's just like, you need to do this and you need to do that. And then the protagonist kind of like initially shirks away from that responsibility. And I think in real life, it's not necessarily as concrete as that. Like we don't have, at least most of us don't have like voices in our head telling us you must do this or you must do that. So what it could be is you're going to work or you're doing something in your life that is highly like not fulfilling you anymore. There's an emptiness inside and that emptiness is living inside a whale. It, it, it's just you're, you feel alone, you feel uh, a sense of alienation and it's up to you to keep exploring unknown territories like uh, keep attending like random meetups keep um you know pushing yourself to do new things to take on new tasks to engage in new hobbies because like in real life there won't be a god or there won't be a, like a force dragging you to hogwarts or whatever to get you onto that that next realm of life it's kind of up to you to to constantly keep exploring your terrain and what's around you and pushing yourself and I, I think that's how we can kind of think of like these very mytho mythological ideas and, and kind of like apply them to our lives. I, I hope it, Claire, I hope I got that right. No, I think that's helpful for, for Maritza's question too, because there's, there's the chaos in life that is like, you lose your job, your child has a terminal illness, you find out your spouse is cheating on you. There's those sort of dragons that come at you um, and you have to defeat them and that's quite obvious. But then there's, you know, internalized, internalized trauma and addiction, right? There's like internal battles that we, that we fight that aren't as clear. Um, and to your point, the, the God in that sense is that logos within us that is just eating away at us and we know what right is right or at least we know what feels wrong um and we can start to kind of tread toward um toward slaying those those dragons and i think you know part of step one and what peterson would really say is starting to you know as harry potter like start going to all your wizarding classes right start to navigate and orient yourself within the world to understand your value structures and so that when those times come um you're more well prepared to just kind of separate it out Okay, so it's going to be Laura followed by Vyom, and then we will do the breakout rooms followed by takeaways. Laura, go ahead. What's your question? You need to unmute yourself. I was thinking that, remember the other day when we were talking about um, developing a language, you know, the, a, a language to talk to yourself um, in your head so you could guide yourself. And I'm feeling like in some sense that that's needed here, you know, when you get to those points when you're in the dark, you know, you have to have a language in which to guide yourself, ask yourself questions, you know, um, push yourself, find new information and things like that. So I think we can apply this to that. Um, you know, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. I think it's an important point because when it's easy to say this all when you're not in the belly of the whale. And once you're in the belly of the whale, there is so much like gross stuff and stomach acid that it's hard to remember what those those tools are, what that language that we use to navigate is. Um, and so habituating it is a really, really great point, but lots of other tools, um, you know, talking to others, journaling, writing them down, you know, all these can help us to navigate. I have a whiteboard here that's just like my SOS that I know if I need something, these are my three things that I need to do, um, you know, in times of chaos. Next up is Vyom. Sorry, I was muting myself. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think uh, uh, Vyom, you need to speak into the mic. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I think the other point of view that I think uh, about God and and this whole idea of about finding your purpose. I think to a large extent, I think a lot of this is talking about finding purpose and finding meaning to life. Of, of Vyom, you really need to talk into the mic. We can All right. Sorry. 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 Can you hear me now? Yes. 
Okay, so I think uh, to a certain extent, uh, a lot of these myths talk about finding a meaning to life, right? or, or, or finding purpose to yourself. And I think, and what's your inner meaning to that? I think that's a very key. And I think you'll be guided by these external forces, whether you call it God, whether you call it whatever else you want to call it, to find your inner meaning and purpose. And, and, and in, in, in Hinduism, there's something called Swadharma, which is what your purpose, your internal or your top level purposes or your internal per, per person's purposes actually. Um, so I think in some ways, this is all about uh, finding that out. That's the way I'm looking at it right now. Oh. I like that. Wonderful. Uh, well, on that note, I'm going to start the breakout rooms. The breakout rooms will last for about 20 minutes because we're running late. I want to keep enough time for our takeaways. So I'm starting the breakout rooms now. <laughs>